Hello and welcome to this A-level biology revision video on the whole topic of disease and immunity or immunology and this is for all exam boards not just OCR however a few named examples will be for this specification. So let's get straight into it the first section looks at types of pathogens First of all though, let's ensure that we're happy with a few definitions from GCSE. Communicable disease is disease that can be passed from one individual to another. A pathogen is a microorganism that causes such disease. And then a vector is an agent that transmits a pathogen from one organism to another. And vectors can be both non-living, so things like the air, water, the ground or soil or living, so insects, and of course the infamous example here being the mosquito. So what types of microorganisms are there that cause infectious communicable disease? Well, we have bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protoxista. These are the four main types. We'll take them one by one. First of all, bacteria. Remember these are prokaryotes, so their cells do not have a nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles and all the rest of it. And then we can classify bacteria depending on A, their shape, or B, their cell wall. In relation to their shape, it is just a bunch of Latin names really that describe what they look like uh, visually. So if bacteria are spherical, in this ball shape, we call them cocci. If these cocci form a chain, we call them streptococci. And then if they clump together into a ball, we call them staphylococci. If the bacteria are rod-shaped or kind of look like pills, we call them bacilli. And likewise, if they form a chain, we call them streptobacilli. We also have vibrio, so they're comma-shaped, it's kind of like a flick. Uh, we then have spirillum, which are spiral-shaped bacteria. And lastly, we have spirochytae, which are meant to look like a corkscrew. So that's just their visual appearance. We can also classify bacteria depending on their cell wall. And they are either gram-positive or gram-negative. And we actually saw this when we looked at staining way back in module 2. Now, of course, you don't need to know the details for this staining process, but essentially gram-positive bacteria will appear purple on a micrograph and gram-negative bacteria will appear red. And this is all to do with how they absorb the dyes that we use in gram staining. Because gram-positive bacteria only have a cell wall, then that cell wall takes up the purple crystal violet dye and that that's what gives it the colour. Gram-negative bacteria, however, are quite special. They have an extra outer membrane above the cell wall, and that membrane is disrupted when we add in ethanol during the staining process, and instead they absorb the counterstain, which is the safranin dye. Now, you don't need to know these details, that's just if you're interested. The main idea is that gram-positive bacteria don't have an outer membrane, whilst gram-negative bacteria do, and that actually makes it harder to treat them with antibiotics. So bacterial infections caused by gram-negative bacteria are a bit of a pain because it's harder to find effective antibiotic treatment. Anyway, what about viruses then? This is of course all very interesting and relevant at the moment. Uh, scientists aren't really sure whether we can actually say that viruses are organisms because strictly speaking they are non-living, they're not alive and that is because they don't satisfy the criteria uh, for being alive. If you remember in maybe primary school you looked at something called Mrs. Gren, the acronym for all the trait that something, an object, has to show in order for us to be able to say it is alive, so you're an organism. Things like movement, respiration, sensitivity, and then reproduction as well. A very important feature of organisms. Now viruses, they can't reproduce independently. They can't make copies of themselves alone. They need a host cell to do that. And this is why we're not really sure whether viruses are organisms whether they're really alive or not 
because really they are very simple structures. Uh, they are all pathogenic, so they're all parasites. Uh, there isn't really any use for them. They're just, they just exist and they harm uh, us. They harm other cells. And yes, they are very simple. They consist pretty much of just nucleic acid coated with some protein. And this nucleic acid can be either DNA or RNA or even, fun fact for you, this will blow your mind probably, but you can actually get double-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA. That does happen, but only in viruses. So yes, some kind of nucleic acid and then a protein coat called a capsid. And then some viruses go a bit further and they give themselves an extra outer layer called a supercapsid. And we also have bacteriophages, which are viruses that target exclusively bacteria. Back in the 20th century, this was becoming popular um, as an alternative method for treating bacterial infections. Uh, but science didn't really know much about it back then. Nowadays, this is becoming increasingly popular and it is possible that this could replace antibiotics because, as you know, there are many issues with uh, antibiotic treatment and we'll look at that at the end of this video. Anyway, yes, bacteriophages, they target bacteria. Here's just a diagram. As you can see, we have the nucleic acid in the middle, the capsid and sometimes a supercapsid. Bacteriophages look a bit different. I have to say this looks like, and I have to say this looks like something maybe out of a science fiction movie. But anyway, it has a head in which it has the nucleic acid. Then this main sort of body section, which kind of acts like a syringe, which injects the nucleic acid into the bacteria. So this bacteriophage attaches, clips itself onto the bacteria and then injects the DNA or RNA into the bacterium. Now in relation to fungi, these are eukaryotes, so they do have a nucleus and they are usually multicellular organisms. Very often people associate fungi with mushrooms and yes, that is correct, but the mushrooms themselves, that is only the fruiting body of the actual fungi. Uh, that's just what appears on the surface, what we see on the ground when we go walking in the forest. Underneath the roots, inverted commas, of the mushrooms uh, is what we call the mycelium, which is the network of all the hyphae. That is, of course, what we can also refer to as the fungus, and the fungal cells are what make up the hyphae. And on the top, of course, we have the mushroom itself, which releases spores. Spores are, of course, used for reproduction. Now, fungi, uh, especially the pathogenic forms of fungi, usually and mainly target plants. So fungi aren't usually a major problem in animals, in us. Uh, they do cause a few diseases, we'll look at them very soon. Uh, but yeah, the, the most devastating impacts are among the plants and crops. And they reproduce by, as I said, producing these spores. And they spread over a very wide area. It can be literally kilometres. And the hyphae themselves, the roots underneath the soil, the mycelium, can also stretch over a very long distance. It can be metres or kilometres. So yes, very interesting organisms. It's interesting to note as well that fungi are saprophytes. So that means that they feed on dead, decaying matter and they do that extracellularly. So they release all their digestive enzymes outside. They do all the digestion um, out of the cell and then they reabsorb it. And that is how they cause disease. They feed on the plant tissues or even on our cells as well, digest them and destroy them. And that is what causes symptoms of the disease. And finally, we have Protoctista. They are also eukaryotes, but most commonly in most cases, they are unicellular. So they're formed of only one cell. I have to say these are very fascinating organisms. There are many examples. Some include amoeba, uh, some protozoans, such as uh, paramecium, and other invertebrates are also protoctista. Sometimes they don't even have a cell wall, and it's just cytoplasm floating around in maybe seawater or freshwater habitats. That's usually where we find protoctista. And we don't usually hear much about them, but they are actually very common. They, they do surround us, pretty much we can say, uh, in the soil and in the water as well.
Some of them are parasitic, but not all of them are. Some feed in an autotrophic manner, some feed heterotrophically, and some do it in both ways. So yes, quite interesting uh, living beings there. You can definitely do some further reading about them. Uh, they are commonly asked about in exam questions. Okay, so that is an overview of all the types of pathogens. Now let's have a look at how exactly these pathogens cause disease, so their modes of action. So we'll start off with the viruses. So viruses have their own life cycle, believe it or not, and part of that includes the replication inside a host cell. So remember, as we said, viruses cannot reproduce independently. They need a host cell to do that. And this is how they cause disease. They invade the host cell, take over all the metabolism, essentially hijacking it, inverted commas, and eventually damaging the whole cell. And that is what causes symptoms of the disease. Let's have a look at this in detail. So here is our virus. It needs to enter this host cell. So it comes along and attaches to a particular receptor. And that induces endocytosis. Whether the cell wants it or not, of course it doesn't, but it's not the cell's decision. It just happens. Uh, endocytosis takes place. The virus is now inside the cell and it's going to cause a lot of harm. First of all, it releases its nucleic acid. And depending on what this nucleic acid is, one of two things can happen. Either if it's RNA, then it gets uh, transcribed into mRNA, and that then gets translated into proteins uh, at the site of protein synthesis, which is, of course, ribosomes. That produces the viral proteins. And the nucleic acid itself gets replicated. And that is what is used to assemble the protein. Uh, there is a whole process of assembly which takes place in the Golgi apparatus and endoplasmic reticulum. And that is what produces new viral particles. And this takes place quite quickly and in very large volumes. So viruses get produced very, very quickly and there will be a lot of them. Because there is so many of them, they just leave the cell in no orderly fashion. They just explode and the cell lyses. It splits, it uh, breaks apart and gets damaged, fully destroyed. And that is what damages the tissues and causes the symptoms of the disease. Now, the other thing to note is if the nucleic acid was DNA, then that actually gets inserted into the DNA of the uh, host cell, so in the nucleus. So actually, uh, a section of the DNA is replaced by the viral nucleic acid. And then the same happens. Transcription, mRNA, translation, protein, and then the assembly. So at the end, what happens is just so many viral particles get produced, they get released, the cell uh, just falls apart, uh, and then the viruses go and infect other cells. This is their mechanism of action. This is just a quick summary. So first of all, the virus attaches to the cell and enters it via endocytosis. It takes over the cell metabolism such that new viruses are produced. These new viruses are released in very large quantities. They destroy the cell surface membrane and cause the cell to lyse, to um, explode and burst. And this is what causes damage to tissues. It's much simpler with other pathogens. So bacteria generally produce toxins um, and they just kind of fall off the bacteria. They are part of the just normal existence of the bacteria. It's kind of like dandruff, to be honest. That's the analogy that we can use. It just falls off the bacteria, um, just part of its normal life. And these toxins come and damage the tissues by piercing the cell surface membranes and also interfering with cell metabolism. That is what also causes the symptoms. Protoctista can also take control of the cell, but the key point is that they do not interfere with any of the genetic information of the host cell. They simply come along and they digest and use the cell contents for their own advantage, for reproduction. So they feed on all of the cell contents and in this way they replicate. Fungi, because they're saprophytic, they uh, digest and destroy the host cells 
pretty much it's their food, it's their nutrition, and they also can produce poisonous toxins in a similar way that bacteria do. So that is it for types of pathogens. Now let's have a look at some named examples of plant and animal diseases. Now we don't need to know much detail about these named examples. However, the key point is that you know the names of the diseases and the type of pathogen that causes it. And then possibly in exam questions, you might be asked to apply your knowledge. So then let's first of all have a look at the plant diseases that we need to know about for OCR. So firstly, we have ring rot. Uh, this is a very characteristic um, distinctive infection in the shape of a circle like this, which affects things like potatoes, tomatoes and aubergines maybe. And it essentially, so it damages not just the leaves of the plant, but also its uh, flowering or fruiting parts or tubers. And it is caused by a uh, bacterium called the Clavibacter michiganensis. Again, you do not need to know the Latin name for it, you just need to know that ring rot is caused by a bacterial infection. And yes, as we said, it affects mainly potatoes, tomatoes, some aubergines by damaging their leaves, tubers and fruit. We then have the tobacco mosaic virus. Quite obviously, it is caused by a viral infection. And the main symptoms are leaf discoloration and as a result that reduces yield. We saw this at GCSE really whereby we know that uh, if there is uh, less chlorophyll in the leaf then there is less photosynthesis, stunted growth and therefore the plant does eventually just die from the viral infection. And actually tobacco mosaic virus, fun fact for you, was the first ever virus discovered when, a few, uh, when, when, when two botanists were working on a sample of the tobacco plant. Then we have blight and this can affect either potatoes where it will be called potato blight or maybe other vegetables, other crops and the name will therefore be different. And this is actually caused by a type of pathogen that we haven't actually seen yet and we don't need to know much about it at all but it's called an umicete. It's a fungal like protoctus, it's quite strange uh, but the particular one that causes blight is called P. infestans and it also has hyphae, so umicetes also produce hyphae, and these hyphae penetrate into the host cells and therefore causing their damage. And the last plant disease is black cigatoka. This is caused by a fungus um, and it affects mainly banana plants, uh, whereby the leaves of the banana plants are penetrated once again by the hyphae and then completely digested, giving a very distinctive black and yellow pattern. Uh, whereby bananas cannot be, well, they can grow, but they are also going to be infected. Uh, so yes, many of these plants mean that uh, if crops do manage to, well, catch this infection, then fields on which the crops have been grown cannot be used for any growth for maybe a year or two years. So the impacts really are devastating because many communities or even whole countries can depend on a few crops and if one of them is wiped out completely by just one pathogen then that's it. Uh, starvation and hunger are inevitable. Okay what about some animal diseases then? There are more of them that we need to know and the first one is tuberculosis often shortened down to TB. This is a bacterial infection caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. There are a few other bacteria that cause it as well but it mainly affects the lung and it destroys lung tissue, uh, mainly of mammals. It can affect, obviously, us as humans, cows, badgers, deers, yeah, many other mammals. And it is actually estimated by the WHO that actually around a quarter of the whole population of the world has a TB infection. So that means that they either have already been infected and they just aren't ill or aren't ill yet, or are infected right now. But if people have latent TB, so this is when they don't have symptoms, they are asymptomatic, uh, they cannot transmit it. And the best cure at the moment is, uh, well not cure, the best prevention is the BCG vaccine, which was developed by a French microbiologist. We then have meningitis, which is uh, also caused by a bacterium. And it is an inflammation of the meninges, which are the sort of membranes that uh, cover uh, the brain. And yes, because it is so close to the brain, then we have a clear threat to the brain and the central nervous system. So it is quite a dangerous infection. 
Um, it can actually spread to the rest of the body and cause uh, poisoning of the blood. Um, usually we see meningitis affecting children and teenagers, and there are many symptoms such as rashes, fever, uh, even things like confusion and, and strong sensitivity to light or loud noises. Um, there are actually also some viral strains of meningitis, but the bacterial ones are most common. So yes, not a nice infection at all. Oh, and by the way, one thing is that whenever you see itis at the end of a condition, it means inflammation of. So meningitis, inflammation of the meningi. Pharyngitis, therefore, yes, inflammation of the pharynx, and so on and so on. And then we have the notorious HIV or AIDS, which is, of course, a viral infection. And this is very special because it destroys the T helper cells and eventually the whole immune system. Now we'll look at T helper cells when we look at specific immunity later on in this video, but these are components of the uh, immune response. And if they are affected, if they are um, infected by the virus, then they cannot carry out their role. So essentially we do not have an immune response at all because the T helper cells are um, a central crucial um, component of the immune system that kind of regulate everything and so if they um, can't carry out their function because they've been infected then that's it. This is where the issue, uh, the problem of HIV comes in. It's not the virus itself but the fact that it disables our immune system Therefore, our body is open to other secondary infections, and commonly that is things like pneumonia, which is come, uh, which which comes from tuberculosis, um, and people do die from that because the immune system cannot deal with it. Um, so yes, HIV does stand for human immunodeficiency virus, by the way, and then AIDS is then not the virus; AIDS is the syndrome, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Uh, late stage HIV, so when uh, the HIV virus has got to such an extent where we then get AIDS. So yes, yeah, so it's got an interesting history, HIV. It's a relatively new virus that uh, arose only in the 20th century at the start. That originally came from chimpanzees and other primates in Africa. And any um, native communities that interacted with chimpanzees, they obviously caught this virus from them. And then uh, it, it was spread around to the Americas and other parts of the world. So it is very commonly passed through uh, bodily fluids. That is how it originally um, got uh, uh, contracted. Um, so... So this can be, for example, through sharing needles, as you know, from drug users, unprotected sexual intercourse and things like that. So any exchange of bodily fluids can pass on the virus. However, you shouldn't be worried if you are talking to or even contacting directly through the skin or handshaking a person with HIV. The virus will not pass through. It's only bodily fluids. It is therefore paramount that the population is well educated about all of these things like, um, uh, well, not actually taking drugs at all in the first place, but then not sharing needles either. Uh, it should be taught about contraception and hygiene in general anyway, all to reduce the spread of this very, very nasty virus. We then have influenza, commonly known as the flu, one very, very um, frequently um, encountered virus. Um, it infects mainly the ciliated epithelial cells of the gas exchange system. So, of course, the gas exchange system is what carries our oxygen and it is primarily um, open to infection because it's just, you know, exposed to the environment. So, yes, influenza, it uh, just leaves the airways open to secondary infection because obviously the epithelial cells are damaged themselves and the cilia on them are also disabled. So it can affect many different mammals, uh, things like birds and pigs or swines, and this is where the name avian flu or swine flu come from, uh, from other different mammals. And the only cure, well there, there is no cure, what am I saying? The only prevention is a vaccine, and that does exist, although it does keep changing, as you know, every year due to mutation of the virus. So yes, it is important that people get vaccinated as much as possible to increase herd immunity and prevent the spread of the virus. Next up, we have malaria, which is caused by a protoctist called plasmodium. 
very interesting disease. It has, uh, well, the plasmodium has quite an interesting life cycle of two hosts. So the mosquitoes, the vectors, and then human cells as well. So um, the plasmodium pathogen, it uh, reproduces inside the female mosquito. That is where sexual reproduction takes place. Asexual reproduction takes place in us, um, in the liver and in our erythrocytes. So um, the mosquito, they need to feed on our own blood cells, that is their meal, in order to then lay eggs and reproduce. At the same time when they feed on our blood, they insert their saliva into our bloodstream and the saliva is what contains the plasmodium pathogen. And then that infects the um, blood cells, of course, the liver and even the brain. Then again, the life cycle repeats and it just keeps uh, exchanging between us as the host and the mosquitoes. The important thing with uh, malaria is to control the vectors of the mosquito. There is really no other solution apart from using nets um, on windows, for example, using insect repellents, long-sleeved clothing and draining standing water, which is the mosquito habitat. Um, at the moment, malaria is very common in equatorial regions, so in Africa, South America, Asia, and there are um, many deaths caused by malaria every year. So it's just important that we, first of all, uh, control the vector and, and prevent its uh, reproduction as well. But at the moment, there is no cure to this plasmodium uh, pathogenic infection. The next one is ringworm, which is a fungal infection, uh, which is an animal disease. Not a major issue, as I say, but it causes a uh, typically circular shaped rash on the skin. So it's just visual symptoms, really nothing else. Uh, it's just something, um, it's a matter of aesthetics, really. Uh, but to be honest, you don't really want a pathogen inside you, so you would cure it using um, antifungal creams. They are common and can be acquired from even just local farms pharmacies. And the same is for athlete's foot, another fungal infection, uh, the name of which is tinea pedia, and it grows on, well, the foot. It's called athlete's foot because um, it is many athletes who have uh, very sweaty feet from their sport that they do, that they practice, and that is um, good conditions for the reproduction of the fungi. So the fungi grow on and they digest skin cells on the feet, and the symptoms of that are itching and then scaling. Again, we can use antifungal creams to cure um, athlete's foot. The next section looks at transmission of pathogens and there are a few ways, there are a few modes through which pathogens get transmitted. Um, it is different in animals and plants. So we have direct and indirect transmission in both animals and plants. So we'll start off with direct transmission in animals. First of all, that can be via direct contact. So that can be body fluid contact or kissing maybe or direct skin to skin contact. Those can all pass on the pathogen. And for every disease, uh, there is, um, it, it has its own mode of transmission. So some can be uh, transmitted by body fluids as we saw with HIV, uh, others can't. So it just depends. Then it can be inoculation. Examples of that are animal bites or wounds or maybe needle sharing. So that is when we have direct exposure into the blood. So the uh, pathogen is inoculated into the blood. And this can also be ingestion. So that involves the uh, consuming of contaminated food or drink or even from your dirty hands to your mouth when you eat. And that is why from pretty much from birth, we are told that we have to wash our hands. It is so crucial that we do that to avoid this um, ingestion of pathogens. Indirect transmission involves something called fomites, and these are inanimate objects such as uh, bedding, clothing, door handles, anywhere on which pathogens can live on, where they can stay. So if you've transmitted the pathogen onto one object, pathogens remain there. If it is not sterilized, then another person can come and uh, contract, collect these pathogens. So that is why at the moment there is a lot of um, uh, sanitizing going on. So to avoid these uh, uh, transmissions of the um, virus via fomites. 
Then of course we have droplet infection, which is where we have airborne droplets of either saliva or mucus. So when we cough or sneeze or even just speak, and that can spread when uh, we do this. So yes, droplet infection is indirect because it does not involve contact. And lastly, we have vectors. And as we saw, these can be either living or non-living. And these are the agents that transmit that pathogen. Now in relation to plants then, direct transmission involves only contact. There is no other way. When there is one healthy plant coming into contact with any part of a diseased plant, and that will very easily pass on the pathogen. And lastly, we will have a look at indirect transmission, and this can be via, first of all, soil contamination, whereby the pathogens remain in the ground, or maybe even just their spores, um, they're left behind. And then, of course, if we start growing other crops, then they can also be infected with the pathogen. So things like crop rotation and very careful treating of the soil um, can reduce uh, this transmission. Then it's mainly vectors, uh, things like the wind and water, as we've seen already. So waterborne, again, or airborne particles uh, can contain the pathogens. And that can spread over very large distances. And this can be even between islands. Uh, for example, with black cigatoka, which is common in the Caribbean, um, literally from one island to the other, a fungal pathogen can be transmitted. And lastly, through animals, which are also vectors. This can be both insects and birds, uh, which uh, transmit the pathogen either during feeding or even some things like aphids. They inoculate them directly into the leaves. So um, the aphids directly pierce the waxy cuticle of the leaves and then uh, that is how the path the, some pathogens are transmitted. Also, human interactions like uh, farming machinery um, and other formalities from us as humans can also contribute to the transmission. So that is why it is important that farmers um, approach the cleaning of their equipment very, very carefully. OK, so that is transmission then. The next thing that we need to have a look at are the factors that affect the transmission. And again, this is different in animals and plants. So first of all, in animals, transmission can increase when we have high population density. So overcrowded conditions when there are many people living over one small area. That's, of course, increasing um, the density. Therefore, you are more likely to start spreading or more quickly spread a pathogen. Compromised immune systems. So weakened immune systems from things like HIV. Poor healthcare or nutrition. There are still countries where there are traditional practices um, being used to treat some diseases or whereby healthcare is just insufficient and cannot deal with the pressure from a certain disease and poor nutrition as well. Our immune system is very often strengthened by what we eat and by our diet. Even things like vitamin C, which is found in many things like oranges and lemons, as you know. And vitamin C is a crucial component of the immune system because it acts as a cofactor in many reactions that take place as part of the immune response and that is why it is important that we have sufficient um, uh, amounts of vitamin C. And then also inadequate waste disposal which can uh, easily trigger the pathogen to uh, spread. In plants this can be for example planting crops that are susceptible to disease so if you know if farmers know that what they're going to plant is already subject to being infected. There is no need to try and even go there and try and, uh, you know, get something out of it. There is no need to take the risk. Uh, similar to animals, if we have overcrowded conditions, so the fields are just tightly packed with crops. Uh, again, poor mineral nutrition, so that also depends on the quality of the soil and even the weather conditions. If they are damp and warm as well, that can also promote pathogens to reproduce. So some bacteria, uh, plasmodium as well, it replicates um, better uh, when it is damp and warm and humid. And one other thing that affects both transmission in animals and plants is climate change. And uh, that can introduce either new vectors or widen the vector habitat. So if uh, temperatures increase, then as we know with plasmodium, as we've just said, they reproduce better in warm conditions. Well, if global warming is going to continue, there will be more areas of the globe where temperatures will be higher, allowing the plasmodium pathogen to reproduce, and therefore more people can get infected with uh, malaria. 
Likewise, increased rain or wind uh, can also promote the spread because these are vectors of these diseases. Now, the next section, 12.4, looks at the plant defences. Now, plants themselves don't have a specific immune system like we do. It is much more basic, can't really say primitive, but um, it is not as efficient as ours. But we still need to know about it. Um, plants have mechanical barriers, uh, such as the waxy cuticle of leaves, which is in most cases an impermeable layer that prevents the entry of pathogens. This can be also bark on trees. Um, then there are some things like sensitive drooping. You might have seen the uh, shame plant, which can contract itself. It can roll up when uh, you touch it or it comes into contact with something. And this is supposed to scare any herbivores. Also things like thorns or spines on cacti, they also deter herbivores away. And of course, the cellular cell wall itself. That is its main purpose to, well, of course, strengthen the cell, but also to prevent entry of pathogens. Now, plants have a very specific physical defense system where, of course, the pathogen has already entered the plant. If it has got past these mechanical barriers, then the plant employs this second physical defense system. It consists of the following steps. So first of all, um, when the cell wall is digested by the pathogen, there are some uh, enzymes uh, that can uh, hydrolyze the, uh, as you know, the um, glycosidic bonds between the uh, cellulose molecules. And that is all detected by the plant itself, by the cell. And that then triggers signaling molecules to induce the synthesis of two important molecules called callose and lignin which are polysaccharides that strengthen the cell wall and fill in any gaps in the plasmodesmata, so the little junctions between the cells. If there are gaps between cells, they need to be sealed off, because if one cell is already infected with a pathogen, it needs to stop there. We need to restrict it to one area of the plant so that it doesn't spread. And sometimes plants can in this way, through this, completely seal off one area or a tissue, isolating it, and then it completely just gets sacrificed, it falls off, you might see uh, dead leaves on the ground, that is what has happened. So a pathogen has infected the leaf and it's just been sealed off and sacrificed. But that's not an issue because the meristem of the plant where most of the cell division is taking place can just regrow and the leaf will then uh, uh, come back into place. So it's quite a clever mechanism actually. And then plants also have chemical defenses whereby they use specific molecules against specific pathogens. So first of all we have some antibacterial compounds and there are many many examples of them. We have things called phenols which are essentially uh, benzene molecules with a hydroxyl group attached to them and they have a antiseptic role. Um, you might have heard of something called carbolic soap. It's that kind of soap that was uh, used in the olden days with that characteristic smell and that orange brown uh, red color. And it contained phenols and it was used as an antiseptic soap. Uh, some uh, phenols are found in sprays that treat uh, pharyngitis. And many essential oils of plants, uh, for example, the vanilla plant, do contain phenols. Cotton has its own version of phenol called gossypol, and then uh, other things called defenses and the lysosomes themselves contain digestive enzymes, also to fight against uh, bacteria. If the pathogen is a fungus, then there are also some antifungal compounds uh, as a defense there in place to fight off them. Again, phenols can be used, also cotton has its gossypol, but other things like caffeine, believe it or not, some things called saponins um, and chitinases, which are, of course, enzymes that can uh, hydrolyze the uh, bonds in the uh, fungal cell wall, which is formed of chitin. Anti-umicete compounds such as gluconases, again, this is also an enzyme that breaks down the glucan polysaccharide, which is found in the umicete cell walls. And lastly, we have some toxins such as cyanide, um, some insecticides such as um, pyrethrins, which are found in chrysanthemums, and then uh, repellents of insects or fungi, uh, things like citronella and pine resin. Uh, all of these shown here. 
So yes, this is not at all an exhaustive list. Many plants have their own uh, specific chemicals as well. Uh, you can do some more research in, uh, on the internet if you want to. But that essentially covers everything we need to know about plants and their diseases. And now for the most exciting and fascinating section of this whole chapter, in my opinion, which is, of course, the immune system itself. Uh, traditionally and typically, we divide the immune system, so immunity, into two types. Firstly, we have the non-specific, otherwise known as the innate immune response, and then we have the specific or acquired immune response. And the difference is quite self-explanatory, really. Uh, the non-specific immune response acts on a very wide variety of pathogens. There is no identification going on. The immune system just knows, um, recognises that some kind of invader, an enemy, a non-self cell, a foreign cell, whatever it may be, has entered the body and something needs to be done about it. So it is a very general mechanism. Nothing is being identified, there is no specificity at all. It's kind of like if you think of the body as a castle, then the non-specific immune response is the, um, the gates and all the soldiers that guard the walls of the castle. And innate just means inborn, that's what it means in Latin. So it's something that you're already born with, it's what you have from birth, there for you whenever you need it, on standby, on alert. Now contrary to that we have the specific immune system and that is something that you acquire when you are exposed to the pathogen and that's where the other name comes from. So you have to be infected with the pathogen first. You have to be uh, exposed to it in some way. In the non-specific response, you didn't need to have that. It was just there already. But with the specific response, the body needs to have seen the pathogen already so that it gets identified. We know exactly who this is, uh, what is the identity of this invader, um, and then we can actually have a more effective uh, more specific immune response, uh, which is of course more efficient, but it takes much longer. Uh, while the non-specific or the innate response takes place uh, within uh, literally minutes or hours, the specific immune response is something that takes place over days and weeks. So the body, the immune system needs some time to kind of change its settings and start altering the way it works so that it can act in a very specific targeted way on one uh, very particular pathogen. So let's have a look now at the components of each of these uh, types of the immune system. So the non-specific immune response is composed of physical defences and that includes obviously our skin, mucus, hydrochloric acid in the stomach, an enzyme called the lysozyme, and then some expulsive reflexes. So that's coughing, sneezing, vomiting, and diarrhea. Now, the three very important other parts are the inflammatory response, phagocytosis, and then blood clotting, which is more scientifically called thrombosis. And we'll look at these in detail in just a second. What about the specific immune response? And we then classify it further into active specific immunity or passive specific immunity. Active immunity arises either when we have infection, so when we're physically ill from the pathogen, or vaccination. And that is when we're exposed to a weakened or dead form of the pathogen, um, but then we still have the same immune specific response. We'll look at that in just a few minutes time. And then passive immunity um, can either be transplacental, it can be obtained via the colostrum, which is breast milk, or through something that we call antibody transferal, which is quite rare nowadays, but is still used particularly in emergency situations. But yes, this is just an overview. Now let's take it step by step. So in relation to all the physical defences then, first of all we have the skin, which is quite obviously a physical barrier through which microorganisms cannot pass through, they cannot penetrate the skin, and so we can say that it is an impermeable surface. But the important thing to note is that our skin is covered with skin flora, and that outcompetes pathogens for space. 
So essentially, skin flora is a population of bacteria, and this is commensal bacteria, which means that they bring no harm. It's kind of like a neutral relationship between us and them. Well, if anything, it's actually a beneficial relationship to us because these commensal bacteria are just calmly sitting on the surface of our skin, as I say, and they're not bringing us any harm. They're simply keeping out other pathogens. So if you think of it like um, houses in the street, these commensal bacteria have already occupied all the houses and they're saying, right, sorry, no more vacancies, off you go. And therefore, no other pathogens can do anything. So, you know, they, they prevent the entry of other pathogens. And then lastly, we have the sebum, which is a oily substance that also covers our skin and produced by glands. And that essentially inhibits uh, the growth of any bacteria. So it's all well and good, the skin pretty much fully protecting us from the entry of pathogens, with the exception when we get injured, when there are wounds. Um, but there are other places through which pathogens can enter our body quite freely. And that is, of course, the gas exchange system. And just such is the nature of our gas exchange system that it is exposed to the environment. Yes, it has to transport oxygen from when we breathe it in to the lungs. And that means it will be inevitably just exposed to everything around us. And therefore, pathogens can very nicely and freely, well, not, not, not nicely at all, but they can freely enter our body through these tracts. And so this is where mucus plays quite an important role. Mucus is a sticky, aqueous and jelly-like substance that kind of traps pathogens um, that are found in, for example, bronchi. So if pathogens manage to get down to the bronchi, they will get trapped in the mucus and then the cilia of the ciliated epithelium cells will waft this mucus away from the lungs. The lungs are a very delicate, um, endangered, threatened area, and we don't want any pathogens down there. So the cilia waft this mucus along with all the pathogens away up into the trachea, where we can cough it up, or the mucus will go down into the digestive system and then it will be dealt with down there. But the key thing, uh, the pathogens don't go into the lungs. That's what we want to prevent. This is why mucus is very important. Uh, it is produced by the goblet cells, again in the ciliated epithelium, and wafted away by the cilia. And one of the multitudes of consequences of smoking, as you know, is of course that the cilia get destroyed by all the tar and other components of the cigarettes, uh, which means that mucus cannot be wafted, it cannot be moved away from the lungs, and so smokers are more susceptible to uh, many infections. So don't smoke is the moral, of course. Anyway, we also have other things like lysozyme. This is an enzyme, as you can guess from the suffix, and its main function is to hydrolyze the glycosidic bonds in peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan, remember, is the component of the cell wall in bacterial cells. So essentially, this enzyme breaks down the cell walls of bacteria, and then the bacteria are open to uh, free transport of water, and therefore they can burst and lyse, and yeah, pretty much they die. So lysozyme uh, breaks the cell wall, and bacteria die as a result. And this is found in things like tears, urine, and even breast milk. And as you can see, there are also uh, tablet forms of lysozyme available. So yes, a very useful enzyme there. We also have hydrochloric acid, which destroys microorganisms by inhibiting their reproduction. That is mainly found in the stomach. And lastly, we have a few expulsive reflexes. And these are things like coughing and sneezing, and they just uh, remove the mucus from the trachea in the form of droplets, of course. And then vomiting and diarrhea are more direct reflexes where the pathogens and any contents of the gastrointestinal tract is directly uh, ejected out of the organism, um, out of the body. Um, that is when the stomach contracts. We have reverse peristalsis and everything just gets thrown up or the other way around if it's diarrhea. So here are all the physical defences of our body. And yes, I forgot to mention this actually. We are at the moment looking at 
our immune system, so the human immune response. It does differ between mammals, it is generally quite similar, but all organisms have their very own immune system. As you know, in plants it is quite basic, in invertebrates even more so. Uh, so yes, this is the human immune system. So now let's have a look at the other three key moments that we find in the uh, non-specific immune response. First of all, that is inflammation. This is a localised response of the tissue to any infection or irritation. Notice that it can be either infection or irritation. So essentially it is the invasion of any foreign substance. This doesn't have to be just a pathogen. This can be uh, any irritants like acid or um, even the sun, even the sun's rays. Well, you know probably very well if you spend too much time out in the sun you get a red skin, that rash. All of this is inflammation. This is when the uh, innate immune response recognises that there is something foreign, something that shouldn't be there. And the typical symptoms, it is characterised by pain, swelling, redness and sometimes a fever as well. So what is the mechanism? Let's have a look at this diagram. So here we have some kind of maybe, well not a twig, maybe some kind of spine from a thorn or whatever, basically a foreign material that uh, breaches our skin and causes a wound. So our skin is now freely open to the pathogen's entry. So pathogens now enter the tissue and then first of all, in the, the first line response, we have mast cells. And these are a form of leukocytes, so white blood cells, and they are just sat there uh, in the tissue and they recognise any damage to the neighbouring cells, so to the derma of the skin. The result of that is that the mast cells produce chemicals called histamines and something that will come across a lot from now on, cytokines. Cytokines are signalling molecules that take part in the immune response. So when we looked at cell signalling um, in the chapter on plasma membranes, that was just a general uh, concept of any molecules that um, uh, move around between cells for communication. That can be both hormones and other proteins. But in the immune system, we talk about cytokines. Histamines are chemicals that cause vasodilation, so that is the widening of arteries and an increase in temperature, so a fever. And all of this inhibits pathogen reproduction. So vasodilation allows blood to flow out of the arteries into the tissue. Now that it's flown out of the arteries, we call it tissue fluid. And in the blood are, of course, all the other white blood cells and other components of the immune system that will do something about the invading pathogen. The increase in temperature also stops the pathogen from reproducing. As you know, bacteria uh, will replicate at a nice comfortable temperature for them. And when the uh, hypothalamus of the brain, which is the thermostat of our body, um, increases the temperature, then of course it is, uh, then we have conditions that are not favourable for pathogens to reproduce. And all of this is triggered by the histamines and they are produced by these mast cells, okay? And yes, in relation to the other white blood cells, uh, we have a chemical gradient of cytokines established. So the cytokines are produced by the mast cells. There will be a large concentration of them at the site of infection and they will spread over the body, over all the blood vessels, and we get a gradient. The um, white blood cells, and we call them phagocytes, we'll look at those in more detail in a moment, um, they kind of detect this chemical gradient and they move against this gradient, so from low concentration of cytokines to high concentration, so to the site of infection, and then they do their job, they go and deal with the pathogens. So essentially we have migration of the phagocytes, all of this is due to the cytokines. So two very important chemicals in inflammation are the histamines and the cytokines. Now we're going to look at the process of thrombosis, and in simple language that is just blood clotting. And this is used to seal any wounds and therefore prevent further entry of pathogens. So when we cut our skin, it's not just the skin itself that gets cut, but also any blood vessels. That's where blood leaks out. And so that needs to be repaired somehow. And this is where uh, blood clotting steps in. So how does it work? 
First of all, the platelets adhere to the exposed collagen. So what does this mean? Uh, as you should remember, hopefully, from the uh, previous chapter in the section on transport, blood vessels have several layers, and the outermost being collagen. When the blood vessel is cut, when there is a breach, then that collagen outer layer is exposed to the blood circulating in the lumen. And one component of blood is the platelets, which are just kind of like remains of cells. And their main function is to exactly create or, well, start off, initiate the process of blood clotting. So platelets stick to the collagen, and that is what starts up the process of uh, thrombosis. As this happens, platelets start to release something called clotting factors, which trigger a reaction cascade. So clotting factors are pretty much protease enzymes that circulate freely in the blood and Whenever they get activated, um, this reaction cascade gets triggered. So it's just one enzyme catalyzing one reaction and then the next reaction. And it's just one after another, this whole stage, uh, staged process, which eventually leads to the formation of a blood clot. So it's just a series of many reactions catalyzed by all these enzymes. And these enzymes are collectively known as clotting factors. And we find them just in the blood. But as they circulate, they are in their inactive form. So they are proenzymes or enzyme precursors, or sometimes called zymogens. And they are activated again by these platelets. And there are actually some conditions um, which can be genetic, whereby not all clotting factors are present, where some people have an absence of them. Uh, I believe there are around 20 clotting factors, and, and even if you are just missing one of them, that of course disrupts the whole reaction cascade, and so blood clotting doesn't happen, or at least it doesn't take place um, as efficiently. And so people do have conditions where blood doesn't clot properly. That of course can be quite dangerous. Anyway, the end goal of all of these reactions is the formation of this fibrin net, which essentially um, forms the clot itself. So fibrin is another protein, um, and it is kind of like a fibre, hence the name, and it kind of uh, forms a net over all of the accumulated um, components of the blood that clot together, and then it's all reinforced with this fibrin net. Then what happens is the epidermal uh, cells of the skin, of the dermis, and then the endothelial cells of the vessels, they grow back and eventually completely seal and heal the wound. So let's have a look at a diagram. So here are the platelets. They attach to any collagen that is exposed um, in the vessels from the wound. The erythrocytes are the red blood cells and they also accumulate at the blood clot site. We then form a thrombus and this is once again catalyzed with all the clotting factor enzymes. Eventually this leads to the fibrin net. So here are all the fibers. Typically it's shown in yellow and that is the blood clot itself. Now uh, the, the wound is sealed and pathogens cannot enter. The cells then regrow and then it is as if nothing has even happened. Uh, well, visually. Uh, we, we can't even recognize that a uh, wound has been there. So you don't really need to know the specific details of the reaction cascade, but here it is in general. We start off with, of course, the wound and the platelets get activated once again by the exposed collagen. They release... Um, something called thromboplastin. That then forms thrombin, which is a chemical um, formed from a different clotting factor called prothrombin, and then calcium ions as well. So they are the reagents of this reaction. Thrombin is the product. Thrombin is then again an enzyme. It catalyzes the formation of fibrin from the, well, reagent, yes, the... Um, not prepared version of fibrin, which is which is fibrinogen. And that, of course, uh, forms the fibrin net and then, uh, of course, the clot. 
there are many other important components of the blood clotting cascade. You can definitely do some reading about it. Even things like vitamin K. Uh, these things are often coenzymes of these reactions and therefore we do need to make sure that we're um, consuming vitamins in our diet because some of them are coenzymes in things like blood clotting. But that is just a general overview. You do not need to know the specific steps. The key points are, I would say, thrombin, thromboplastin, and then the formation of fibrin from fibrinogen. Okay. And lastly, we're going to talk about phagocytosis. You would have seen this term at GCSE probably, but now we're going to have a look at it in more detail. So literally, it means cell eating. That's what the etymology of the word is. And this is carried out by, well, quite obviously, phagocytes. Phagocytes are leukocytes. Leukocytes are white blood cells, remember, that carry out this process of cell eating. And it's not our own cells, but rather pathogenic cells. So they engulf them and digest them. That is the uh, process by which the infection is fought off in our body, phagocytosis. There are two main types of these cells. Uh, the ones that we look at A-level are neutrophils and macrophages. Okay, Both of them play an important role in both the innate and specific immune response. So let's have a look at the stages of phagocytosis. We're going to use quite a simplified diagram, so do listen carefully. So whenever the pathogen enters the body, it does, as you know, release chemicals um, from itself. And these can be toxins uh, in the case of bacteria that essentially attract the phagocyte. So the phagocyte does have these like uh, detectors that can sort of alert the phagocyte right. There is a foreign body that needs to be dealt with. So it attracts to it. Um, it actually kind of chases it. So the phagocyte follows the pathogen eventually uh, catching up with it. And then once the phagocyte senses and attaches to the pathogen, it engulfs it using endocytosis. So now we have the pathogen uh, enclosed in a vesicle. And this vesicle has a special term, we call it a phagosome. At this point, the pathogen is still alive. So we need to do something about it, we need to kill it. So that's what the phagocytes do with the aid of the digestive enzymes found in lysosomes. So lysosomes fuse with the phagosome to form a new compartment called a phagolysosome. And that is where we have the digestive enzyme breaking down the bacteria, digesting them and killing them. Any nutrients, so proteins, maybe lipids, um, uh, polysaccharides are absorbed by the phagocyte itself because they are very useful, as you know. And then any remains, anything that we don't need or the waste is released by exocytosis. So on this diagram, the lysosomes are missing, but they are very important. They are the ones that um, sort of help the bacteria to uh, get digested. Now, two other things to mention. The cytokines do also play an important role in phagocytosis, as we've seen already. And an example of cytokines are the interferons. Uh, we didn't actually look at these at A-level, but they are actually quite important uh, messenger chemicals that you can definitely do some reading about. Uh, as I keep saying, to be honest, you can do further reading with pretty much anything, but you know what I mean. Uh, interferons, very interesting uh, chemicals. And then we also have opsonins. Opsonins are tagging chemicals. They're kind of like flags or labels that bind to pathogens, and that helps them to identify them as non-self. So when phagocytes see these opsonins, they immediately recognize that, right, okay, this has been identified by the immune system, so by my colleagues, inverted commas, as a pathogen, and I need to do something about it. So that is why opsonins are important. The phagocytes themselves have opsonin receptors, and all of this aids the process of phagocytosis. And opsonins can be both uh, particular proteins that we have floating around in our blood. Uh, this is called the complement system, uh, formed of the complement proteins. Again, that is a separate topic that we quite unfortunately don't look at. But anyway, um, and then antibodies, they can also act as opsonins, but we'll come on to that a bit later. So that concludes everything that we need to know about the innate immune response. 
Now we're going to have the specific immune response, and this gets quite complicated, I have to say. Many students struggle with this area of the chapter because there are just so many diagrams, so many links happening, different reactions and so on, and many different types of cells as well. We'll try and go through it slowly despite it being a revision video, but just try and uh, pay attention and try to follow what's going on. Again, you can do some more reading if you are unsure. So a few definitions first of all to get us started. An antigen is a molecule, and this is either a protein or a glycolipid, which is present on the surface of a cell, identifying it either as self, so from our own body, or foreign, therefore non-self. And it comes from the word antibody, generator. That is where antigen comes from. What is an antibody then? Well, it is a glycoprotein and the specific term that you should use is an immunoglobulin that responds to the specific antigen as we saw with the um, formation of the word antigen. Now the specific immune response we can also divide into First of all, the humoral response, and this targets any antigens that are found in the intercellular fluid, so essentially outside of cells, mainly in the blood or in tissues, and this is done via the production of antibodies. And then secondly, we have the cell-mediated response, and this targets any infected self-cells of the body. So here we're focusing on um, cells rather than the um, antigens present in the intercellular fluid. And as a rule, very generally, the humoral response involves the um, fight against bacterial infections, while cell-mediated response is more for viral infections or things like cancers. Now let's get ourselves acquainted with a few of the components and cells involved in the specific immune response. This is going to be a long list, but just stick with it. First of all, we have macrophages. We saw those already. These are a type of phagocyte. Now then for the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are a very special um, type of cell, also leukocytes, of course. They're white blood cells, and we have either B lymphocytes, and these are, as we said, white blood cells, and they're called B lymphocytes because they mature in the bone marrow, so B for bone marrow. And then we have T lymphocytes, uh, also again white blood cells, and this time they mature in the thymus. A thymus is a gland, and because it begins with a T, we say T lymphocytes. You can also say B cells and T cells. Lymphocytes are, of course, more specific. Now then B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, they also divide into their own uh, types of cells, all forming a large family of lymphocytes. First of all, we have T helper cells, and um, the name kind of uh, describes their role, lymphocytes that help and activate B lymphocytes. So what happens in the immune system is that we have B lymphocytes, uh, that, and their main function is to produce antibodies, um, that is their main role um, with fighting the pathogen. And then T lymphocytes kind of regulate that. Instead of having one cell uh, producing antibodies and then regulating how many antibodies are to be produced and things like that, we just have two separate cells. So the work is divided between two uh, workers, we'll say. We then have something called antigen-presenting cells, very often APCs for short. And this is any cell at all that contains foreign antigens on its surface. So it presents or shows to other cells any antigens. And this is usually phagocytes. Um, this can also be infected or cancerous body cells or even transplanted tissue cells. Uh, we'll have a look at this in a bit more detail in just a few moments. We then have plasma cells, and these are a type of B lymphocyte that secrete antibodies. And then onto the memory cells. Both B and T memory cells exist. And these are the ones that remain in the blood circulation um, after the infection, and they form the secondary immune response. So the primary immune response is when you're infected with the actual pathogen, um, and the secondary immune response is if you are exposed to it again, so in a repeated infection, which is much faster, um, and it takes place virtually immediately.
Lastly, we have T cytotoxic or T killer cells. And again, these are lymphocytes and they produce a chemical called perforin, which pierces the cell surface membrane of either pathogens or our own cells, which are either infected, cancerous or transplanted. If it is an infected cell with a virus, remember we did see how viruses infect our own cells at the start, then we can't really do much about it. That's it, the cell has been infected, viruses have been produced, they go and infect other cells, everything gets out of control. So to avoid all of this, we just kill our own cell. Just to avoid any problems, it's just the easiest route, it's the easiest way out of it. These T cells identify that, right, our own body cell, it has been infected by a virus. Unfortunately, we're just going to have to sacrifice it. And that doesn't matter because the neighbouring cells can just do a bit of mitosis and divide and replace it. Uh, but the crucial key point is that we're killing our own cell, but at the same time, the viruses also get uh, killed, eradicated. The same happens with cancerous cells. They display their own antigens on their surface, which also identify them as, well, yeah, non-self. So uh, cells, abnormal body cells, we'll say. And then transplanted body cells obviously will have different antigens because they've come from a different organism. Well, sorry, from a different person, yes. Um, so very often when people do have transplants, they need to um, take in certain um, immunosuppressant drugs that stop the immune system from identifying them as foreign because obviously the transplanted cells are there for a reason. Right, now let's actually have a look at what happens. Again, this is quite a complicated process and in reality it is even more sophisticated than what we see here at A level. So what we're going to look at now is quite generalised. Okay, so here is our pathogen. It has already entered the body and the first cells on site of infection are of course the phagocytes. They do their job, they, they go through phagocytosis, ingest the pathogen and then one crucial step that we haven't seen yet is the idea of antigen presentation. So phagocytes, they've ingested the pathogen, they've processed it inside, they've digested it and one key step in that digestion, in that processing, is that they take the antigens that were on the pathogen, those molecules remember, uh, that identify the pathogen as foreign, they take those molecules and then they put them uh, the, the phagocytes, they put them on their own surface. But they don't just put them alone, they put them on these kind of like plates. These plates are called the Major Histocompatibility Complex, MHC for short. Quite a complicated name, but it's quite simply a protein to which the antigen is attached. And this is important for the next stages where we have other cells involved. But essentially, um, the phagocyte, it has done a bit of cell eating. It has collected all the pathogens and most importantly, the antigens. And then it goes and presents them on its own surface. It's kind of like, here is what I found. Yeah. Then we have a specific T helper cell, uh, TH, sometimes abbreviated to, and it binds to the antigen on the major histocompatibility complex, and this activates it. So all the T helper cells, uh, and not just them, all the T lymphocytes and even the B lymphocytes as well, they all have very specific receptors. These receptors can be either um, antibodies or a version of antibodies, but you have to understand that they are extremely specific and they act only on one type of antigen. Um, it is quite overwhelming actually um, that our body, our immune system works in such a way that there are so many B and T lymphocytes each of which will produce its very own receptors. Uh, well, not produce, but it will have its own receptors and they will all differ from each other. So one T lymphocyte will have its own receptor. The next T lymphocyte will have a completely different receptor. So one might be circular shaped, the other one might be triangular shaped. The next one might be parallelogram shaped or whatever. The key point is that they are all um, differ from each other because they are all specific to one and one and only antigen. So once again, every T and B lymphocyte, each one, each one alone, 
makes its very own receptors or antibodies that will fit only one antigen. We actually have something like 10 to the 10th power of possible combinations for all the different 3D shapes of the molecules of the antigens and each one will be complementary to a specific antibody. So our body has kind of prepared itself prior to an infection. So already from birth, we are prepared to um, fight off essentially any pathogen at all, any antigen. Um, maybe some don't even exist in nature. It's just a kind of, um, uh, not really a prerequisite, but it's just there already in preparation, just in case we get this antigen. Now, I'll make this idea a bit clearer as we move on, but the key point is we have a T helper cell. It has a very specific receptor on its surface that is complementary to the antigen that is being presented by the phagocyte, okay? And uh, there is another receptor on the T helper cell that binds to the MHC complex. And we actually say MHC2 because there is also a thing called MHC1, but at the moment we're interested in MHC2. And that then activates the T helper cell. So it has realized that a pathogen has um, invaded the body uh, with the aid of this antigen presenting cell, which is in most cases a phagocyte. What is the result of this T helper cell activation? Well, it produces um, cytokines called interleukins. So interleukins are a type of signaling molecule, a type of cytokines produced by lymphocytes. And the result of that is the stimulation of other T cells to start rapid division. So the T helper cell that has binded to the APC, the antigen presenting cell, and to the antigen and MHC complex gets stimulated, it activates, and it starts dividing itself. And it produces interleukins that stimulate other T helper cells with the very same receptor to start dividing as well. So now we're going to have an increasing population of these T helper cells that can start actually doing something about this pathogen. The next step is that the T helper cells, as the name tells us, uh, they start helping B lymphocytes. So they produce interleukins. The interleukins are detected by B lymphocytes and eventually uh, the B lymphocyte and the T lymphocytes will meet up together. Um, this is quite a improbable event, I have to say, because um, every B lymphocyte, as you know, has its very own receptors on its cell surface. And by the way, B lymphocytes, their receptors are in fact antibodies. So they are the immunoglobulins. They stay on the cell surface membrane. The T helper cells uh, receptors, they are similar in structure and function to antibodies, uh, but we can't call them that. We call them T helper cell receptors and they stay on the cell surface membrane. They don't move anywhere. Antibodies, however, as you know, they can get secreted. Anyway, the B lymphocyte with a very specific receptor has to find the T lymphocyte with the exact same receptor for the very same antigen. So as you can imagine, this meetup, this rendezvous is very improbable. It is quite unlikely. The analogy here is you have to think about maybe I don't know, let's say you're traveling in a train or the underground and you're sitting reading a book and you're on a very specific page of that book. You look up and you see opposite you is sitting another person with the very same book and even more so, they're also on that exact same page. What is the probability of that happening? Very low. And it still exists, that can happen, but it's just so unlikely. And that is kind of the scale to which this happens, because as we said, there are 10 to the 10th power possible combinations. And so only one of those B or T lymphocytes has to um, match or well join up with, meet up with the matching B or T lymphocyte. So this pair of lymphocytes has to match up. When they bind together, that triggers the next um, step of this immune response. The B lymphocytes get activated again when the T helper cell binds to them and they undergo something called clonal expansion. Clonal expansion. So this B lymphocyte, we call it a clone, 
um, because it is the clone of a cell that produces a specific antibody and then clonal expansion it um, widens its population so now we get many many B lymphocytes that have divided by mitosis and start producing antibodies so yes B lymphocytes then uh, differentiate divide by mitosis into two cells as we saw already this can be plasma cells and they are the ones that produce the antibodies, the immunoglobulins. So plasma cells produce antibodies. OK, remember that. Or they can differentiate into B memory cells. And those are the ones that are involved in the secondary immune response, as we've seen already. As you can see, plasma cells have quite a complex endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus network. This explains why they need it, because they need to produce these antibodies. So quite a good application there. This could be a possible exam question. Anyway, so let's review this once again. Pathogen gets uh, digested by the phagocyte. The phagocyte becomes an APC and presents the antigen on its surface. The corresponding T cell with the complementary receptor to the antigen is found... Um, and this process is actually called clonal selection, where, the, where we're selecting the correct matching T lymphocyte. It binds to that antigen and it gets activated. Activation then causes the T helper cell to produce cytokines called interleukins, and they stimulate other T cells to divide rapidly. We actually haven't talked about this yet. Um, I should mention this now. T lymphocytes also divide into other types of cells, as we saw already. We have T cytotoxic cells or T killer cells. They are the ones that kill infected body cells or other APCs. So that is cancerous cells or transplanted cells. Then we have something called T regulatory cells. Uh, we haven't seen this yet, and these are the ones that suppress the immune response once the pathogen has been eradicated. So once the immune system has done its thing, um, it's uh, produced antibodies, phagocytes have got rid of all the pathogens, we then need to stop. Uh, otherwise, T helper cells can start uh, going a bit too far and they can start attacking our own body cells and that needs to be stopped. So T regulatory cells, uh, they, they also produce interleukins that kind of say, right, OK, press the brakes now, enough, we're finished, we don't need to carry on with the immune response, the pathogen has been dealt with. And lastly, we have the T memory cells that also remember what antigen is being dealt with in this immune response should we be exposed to that antigen again uh, for a repeated second time in the future in this way forming the secondary immune response okay now when t helper cells bind to the uh, corresponding b lymphocyte we also get the next activation those b lymphocytes then start dividing by mitosis into two types of cells either plasma cells that secrete antibodies or again, memory cells that just memorize what antibodies need to be produced in the event of the antigen um, coming into the body once again in the future. Now, one other thing to note is that there is a second route of this pathway, and this is when the pathogen gets detected directly by the B lymphocyte. So here's our pathogen again. Uh, the B lymphocyte can actually act as an antigen presenting cell at the same time. Uh, this time we don't necessarily need the help of the T helper cell. The B lymphocyte can do it independently. So the B lymphocyte has seen uh, the antigen, well, the, the corresponding B lymphocyte. So not all of them, only one of them. Only one B lymphocyte recognizes the antigen. It knows which one is the matching antigen and it gets activated. And yes, it then divides into either plasma cells or memory cells. This only happens when there is a very high concentration of antigens in the body. What does that mean? That means that the disease is already at late stages. So we have been ill for a, quite a long time already. And this can be quite dangerous. We don't want this. We want to get rid of the infection as quick as possible. So that is why we need the T helper cells. They need to aid, they need to assist these B lymphocytes to start producing these antibodies as quickly as we can. That is what is uh, doing the main job. Those antibodies are the ones that um, are the main component of this specific immune response. And to start producing them quickly to get this all into gear, the T helper cells are the ones that uh, help the B lymphocytes out. 
So now let's just go over a bit of a summary of this, uh, a few of the key points to take note of. So the first thing that happens is the phagocytes go and collect the antigens via the process of phagocytosis. That is either at the site of infection, so where the pathogen entered our body, or just generally in the blood, if the antigen is already circulating in the blood. And then they present them on their surface using MHC2. So it's kind of like the phagocytes have gone mushroom picking or berry picking. They've collected everything that they need and then they've presented their basket to the uh, lymphocytes. Where does this happen? The macrophages uh, or other phagocytes, they migrate from the site of infection or from wherever they have been collecting antigens to the lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are part of the lymphatic system. It is a separate network of vessels uh, running kind of parallel to blood vessels that contains lymph. Uh, but anyway, the main idea is that they migrate the lymph nodes and that is where clonal selection takes place. So the phagocytes have already presented the antigens on their surface. They arrive at the lymph nodes and say, right, here we go, lymphocytes. Do any one of you recognise what I found here? Can any of you see if this is your antigen, your special complementary antigen? And one of the T lymphocytes will say, oh, yes, I recognise that. Goes and binds to the um, antigen presenting cell, the phagocyte, binds and gets activated. And then we have the rest of the immune response. So that is what happens. This is what we call clonal selection, where we have that specific T lymphocyte getting selected. It's recognised the antigen and does something about it. Then their activation causes proliferation. And this is a very good word to use. It basically just means the differentiation and uh, uh, division of the T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes later on into their respective um, other types. So uh, cytotoxic cells, helper cells, and then for B lymphocytes, plasma cells and memory cells. All of that is proliferation. And they also produce interleukins and they activate both the B lymphocytes, after which they will bind together, and other T cells. The B lymphocyte then undergoes clonal expansion, uh, whereby it again proliferates into plasma cells uh, being the majority. So around 90%, I think, of all the B cells go on to become plasma cells and only some remain as memory cells. Then immunoglobulins, so the antibodies, are produced by the plasma cells and released into the bloodstream where they start opsonizing pathogens. That's the word that we can use here. So they start identifying the pathogens and that increases the rate of phagocytosis. First of all, because the phagocytes now know that this is a foreign agent and needs to be removed. And secondly, by agglutination. So agglutination is when the antibodies, and this is uh, exclusively by their structure, they start clumping these pathogens together. So take a look at this diagram. Because of the antibodies and this Y-shaped structure, they have two arms. They bind to uh, one pathogen on one arm and then to a second pathogen on another arm. And in this way, many antibodies can bring together all the pathogens into one space. And that makes it so much easier for phagocytes to come and digest them all as one whole. So it's one big, large meal for them. And lastly, the B memory cells and T memory cells as well, they will remain in the blood, um, and it could be for as long as the whole of your life, and they will get immediately activated as soon as there is a secondary infection. And that is what prevents symptoms of the disease. That is where our immune system uh, is very clever and pragmatic, um, whereby um, everything that it has done it has remembered all of the hard work that has been going on and it knows exactly what it has to do again so it just repeats the same but straight away so there is no need to go and find that clone that t lymphocyte there is no need to find that uh, there is no need for the process of clonal selection that is what makes the immune response so long it takes such a long time to find this t lymphocyte and for that to then bind with the b lymphocyte it takes just so long um, but then once we already know what type of antibodies have to be produced it's fine we can 
generate the immune response straight away, pathogen is eradicated and probably we won't even know that we've been infected in the first place. Okay, so that was the whole complexity of the specific immune response. We just now need to have a look at antibodies and their specific structure. So as you know, they have a very typical uh, distinctive Y shape. They have two strands on them or two chains. We have a heavy chain, which is in the middle. That is what forms the Y shape. And then on the outside, we have the light chains. Uh, they're called heavy and light solely because of the um, amino acids present and their uh, respective uh, molecular masses and so on. Um, but yeah, quite simply also because the light chains are shorter. But anyway, heavy chains in the middle and light chains on the outside. We then have regions of the antibodies. These parts at the top here are variable regions. These are the ones that change from antibody to antibody. So this is where we have the specific 3D shape that is complementary to a specific antigen. So this is what changes. The remainder is the constant region and that is what is common to every antibody. So every B lymphocyte that produces antibodies will have the same constant region, but each one will have different variable regions. And that is what um, makes this or forms this uh, element of alteration of this changing of settings in order to um, generate an immune response for a particular antigen, all due to these variable regions. And they are coded for by the rearrangement of genes um, of uh, different um, amino acids that produce these uh, uh, immunoglobulins. Uh, that is a very complicated process, but you have to understand the main idea is that every B lymphocyte, every each and single one of them has its very own antibodies for a very particular antigen. And it could be any molecule at all that can exist in nature. Once again, 10th to the 10th power, that is an absolutely astronomical number. And one of them is bound to be complementary to some kind of antigen. And that is why even if a virus um, and the antigens on its surface change due to mutation, it's OK, because there will definitely be some kind of B lymphocyte that will be um, complementary by the lock and key mechanism to the antigen. OK, now we're going to look at autoimmune diseases. Uh, this is just a very quick section. You don't need to know too much about this. But this is essentially where we have conditions uh, where the immune system does not recognize our own body cells and it thinks that they are pathogenic. It thinks that they are foreign and destroys them. Um, this can be caused by a number of reasons. It could be some genetic tendencies. Um, it could be a strong reaction to a mild pathogen. So if we only have a bacteria that's not doing too much harm, but there is still an immune response, um, if the immune response happens to be just very strong or unnecessarily um, specific, then uh, that can lead to an autoimmune condition. And then the ineffective functioning of T cells. Remember we said that the two components of the specific immune response, the B lymphocytes that produce the antigens, and then the T cells that kind of control this production of antigens, if they can't control it properly, if they can't then suppress the production of antibodies once the immune response has um, terminated, once we've eradicated the pathogen, then, you know, this can get out of control and our own body cells can be attacked by our own immune system. So the immune system needs to control itself so that it doesn't get carried away, okay? A few examples that we need to know. Uh, type 1 diabetes, it is a condition that affects the pancreas and the insulin-producing cells. So this is when insulin is not produced adequately or not even produced at all. Um, so blood glucose concentrations remain very high. And this can be treated either with a pancreas transplant or in most cases it's just regular insulin injection so that blood glucose concentration is regulated. So this is a genetic, usually, disease. It's an autoimmune condition uh, in contrast to type 2 diabetes, which is uh, as a consequence of uh, your environmental, your lifestyle choices, so diet. Then we have arthritis. Scientifically, it is rheumatoid arthritis, and this affects mainly joints in bones, and unfortunately, it also has no cure, but if you use immunosuppressant drugs, so those that 
um, kind of stop the immune system from acting on its own cells. Um, and that actually not just on its own cells, but other ones as well. And this is where immunosuppressants have a disadvantage, is that whenever you actually get a different disease, your immune system, because it's under immunosuppressants, yes, okay, it won't start destroying your own cells, but then it won't start destroying pathogens either. So that is, of course, a problem. But then we do have some painkillers, anti-inflammatory drugs and so on, and they are available and they are commonly used. And lastly, we have lupus, which also targets either the skin or bone joints, or in fact, it can be any organ. And it is actually commonly the kidneys. Also, unfortunately, there is no cure, but the method of treatment are similar to that of arthritis. Uh, there are many other examples of autoimmune diseases, things like multiple sclerosis. And in general, it is around 5% of the whole human population that does suffer from these conditions. So it does happen. It can, as I say, be genetic. Sometimes it can happen just randomly as a result of a too harsh of an immune response. So yes, we just need to be aware of this. And now for the very last section of the whole chapter, which is about treating and preventing disease. Uh, so first of all, um, the definition for immunity, and that is the ability to produce antibodies. We then have different types of immunity. We actually kind of saw this when we first looked at the immune system uh, earlier in this video. First of all, we have natural active immunity, and that is the production of antibodies following infection. So what we've just discussed. So you've been infected by a pathogen that has done some harm to us, and our immune system has, in a natural way, um, tried to fight off the infection. We then have natural passive immunity, and this is when you acquire antibodies from your mother, um, either through the placenta, which is why we call it transplacental. So during your development, during the development in the womb, uh, antibodies are transferred through the placenta to the developing um, offspring. Or they are also acquired through the colostrum, which is the very first um, sort of portion of breast milk that is produced. And it is also very rich in these antibodies. They are also passed on to the child. Now, in relation to artificial immunity, we also have artificial passive immunity. And that involves the direct transferal of antibodies. Um, and unlike uh, natural passive immunity, this is not from your mother, but it can be from any other um, individual. It is usually an animal that has already been either infected or already has produced antibodies, and they are transferred usually via injection to the patient's bloodstream so that, so that an immune response happens straight away. And we tend to use this in emergency situations, um, maybe when someone has... Uh, caught rabies for example there we need to have the antibodies straight away there is no time for the clonal selection and expansion to take place because the symptoms of the disease are fatal and then we have artificial active immunity and this quite simply is vaccination so let's have a look at this in more detail now because vaccination is quite an interesting invention so it's actually quite similar to the uh, specific immune response. Uh, but the first step is where we have to prepare a safe form of the pathogen, because obviously what we're after is the body needs to deal with the antigen, but at the same time not experience any symptoms of the disease. So somehow we need to keep, preserve the antigen, but the pathogen has to be disabled and there are a few ways of doing that. We can either completely kill it or inactivate it. We can use weakened strains of the live bacteria and viruses. So we can actually use the pathogen itself, but weakened strains of it. That means that um, some mild symptoms of the disease will still be there. Uh, we can alter the toxin molecules. So this is mainly for bacterial or fungal infections, whereby we use the uh, toxins as the antigens but obviously, again, we disable them. We can also isolate the antigens of the pathogen and use solely them. So we can ignore the actual bacterium or virus itself and only use its molecules on the surface. Or lastly, we can genetically engineer the antigen itself, which is becoming quite popular now. And with the vaccines against COVID-19, there are a few out there. For example, the Epivac vaccine does use genetically engineered antigens. Then the next step is the insertion of a small volume of the vaccine, so the prepared pathogen, 
into the bloodstream, usually it's injected. Uh, however, you can get vaccine, which can be in the form of nasal sprays, I think, uh, some other forms as well. Uh, but yes, mainly injected. And then that triggers the primary response because the uh, immune system recognises uh, that we have a foreign um, cell. It recognises the antigen. However, there are very few, if any, symptoms at all of the disease because, as you know, the antigen or the pathogen itself has been weakened or inactivated completely. And yes, therefore, that then triggers a secondary immune response, the production of antibodies or the selections or the lymphocytes. All of that happens. All that we've seen, you, of course, don't know anything about it. And then just the same idea happens. We have the memory cells that have remembered, that have memorized what they need to do in the event of a second exposure. And that's it. That's what happens. You won't be ill, therefore, because you've already seen the pathogen. You've been exposed to it. Uh, although artificially, you've still seen the pathogen, so therefore you can defend yourself against it in the future should you need to. So that's just how a vaccine works. Two other definitions that we need to know is a epidemic is a rapid spread of disease at a local or national level, and a pandemic is a rapid spread of disease at an international level. But this is kind of all obvious now. I don't think this is new to you anyway. Um, but the key idea is that vaccination can prevent this. And that is why it's so important uh, to look at and learn about all these vaccines that are about now. And here is just a good diagram that uh, sort of illustrates how vaccination works, but in a bit more detail. Now for the medicines then, because this is another way of treating disease. And drugs can either just relieve the symptoms of the disease, so they will make you feel better, or they will completely cure the disease. And these are much rarer. You don't tend to find many drugs that actually deal with the root of the problem. Many just stop you from feeling ill, and then your own immune system deals with the rest. So painkillers, any anti-inflammatory or anti-acidic drugs are ones that just reduce symptoms, okay? On rarer occasions, we do get medicines like chemotherapy, antibiotics, and antifungals, which actually cure the disease. So they will kill the uh, fungal or bacterial cells or the rapidly or abnormally dividing cells of our own body. Okay. Now, medicines are very often, in the majority of cases, sourced from plants. Not always, though. Uh, we do find them in other um, organisms. Some are produced synthetically at the moment, but initially they were all found either from plants or from some uh, natural source. And there is such a wide variety of plants that can give rise to essentially so many medicines out there. And that is actually why we should try to maintain biodiversity in places like tropical rainforests, because there are so many plants there that we haven't analysed yet, that we don't know about, that could be possible sources of cures for anything like cancer or any other diseases. So that, that is one of the reasons why we should be very careful with uh, things like deforestation. Anyway, here is just a few um, examples of some medicine sourced from either plants or fungi. Uh, this is not at all an exhaustive list. There are so many of them out there. You can also do some of your own research. But for the exam, you just need to be aware of some of these examples. So the first one is penicillin. This is quite famous, I have to say. You probably all know about the story of Alexander Fleming, inverted commas, accidentally discovering penicillin when he was uh, experimenting with bacteria. And he did find a zone of inhibition that was not caused by any chemicals, but rather from this fungal mold called Penicillium natatum. And some other scientists later did some work on trying to extract this penicillium mould and eventually this did create the antibiotic that is produced synthetically nowadays. We also have aspirin which is sourced from willow bark called sallow and this is just a painkiller. Uh, this is actually found on the WHO's list of most essential medicines so it's a very very common drug and it can be effective um, against um, uh, many different uh, symptoms of uh, quite harsh diseases. We then have digoxin, which comes from the digitalis in foxgloves. And this is a heart drug that either treats heart failure or some other conditions. 
And lastly, we have calendula oil. And this comes from obviously the calendula flower and it's an antiseptic. There are actually many plants out there that act as antiseptics uh, because of some of their um, antibacterial uh, or antifungal chemicals that they produce that we saw earlier on in this video. And the last section we're actually finally there is antibiotics. This causes so many problems as you probably already know. Um, but essentially bacteria, they have developed resistance to penicillin. This was the first antibiotic that they developed resistance to because this was the first uh, antibiotic discovered. And it then made it an ineffective treatment. So whenever there was a bacterial infection, they did not react to this antibiotic and so nothing happened. And eventually this became the case for other antibiotics as well. Because they're just so common, they're used so commonly, bacteria have just got used to them. They recognise that this is a chemical trying to kill them and they just don't um, respond to it. Of course, that's not the mechanism of the action. Uh, what actually happens is we have a random mutation. This is the main source of variation, as you know. So a random mutation causes a change in the surface receptors on the bacteria, so any glycoproteins to which the antibiotic itself binds to. And if that has changed shape, then uh, the antibiotic, which has not changed shape, is no longer complementary to it, and so there is no effect. This is an advantage for the bacteria. It is such a trait that makes the bacteria more fitted or better fitted to survive and reproduce because it has this gene um, for a different surface receptor that prevents it being affected by the antibiotic. And by natural selection, it then goes on to divide and reproduce and the offspring will therefore inherit the same genes because of this being an advantageous trait. The antibiotic itself also applies some selection pressure. So again, this causes the bacteria with this gene, they are pressured to be uh, naturally selected. And then, yes, as we said, the mutation is passed on to the daughter cells. And as you know, bacteria, they can reproduce very, very quickly. In as fast as 20 minutes, they double, and therefore a whole population of antibiotic resistance can arise very quickly. And that is how this is developed. It takes longer for some antibiotics and takes quicker for other types. Um, there are very few probably antibiotics out there um, that, uh, to which uh, and bacteria are not yet resistant to. But this is uh, developing very quickly. Bacteria are becoming resistant faster than we are finding a solution to this problem. And so many um, projects of uh, many medical organisations are currently investing. There is even like a lottery prize, I believe, for some kind of scientists who can find uh, a solution to this problem. But uh, yeah, essentially, we do need to tackle this somehow. And we can do this um, by minimising the unnecessary use of antibiotics. Um, so that means that if you have a bacterial infection, that does not mean that you run away straight to the doctor and say, doctor, doctor, I have a bacterial infection, please give me antibiotics. No, you should not do that. If your own immune system is capable of dealing with the infection independently, there is no need to use antibiotics. Their interference is so unnecessary and as you can see it is harmful because therefore in the future um, when somebody is actually ill with an infection antibiotics won't do anything they won't help and so we're kind of left powerless really also it is important that if you do take antibiotics is that you complete the whole course of the treatment so that uh, so that all of the bacteria are killed and none remain so that even if they do develop resistance um, they're not left over they can't divide and so this is not passed on. And lastly, quite simply, good hygiene so that we can reduce the spread of any uh, bacterial infection and at the same time, antibiotic resistance. Oh, and yes, I forgot to mention two examples, MRSA, which stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, so it is the bacteria, uh, remember Staphylococcus, so it is circular bacteria that clump up together and they are resistant to an antibiotic called methicillin. There are many antibiotics out there, some other examples are like amoxicillin, um, penicillin as we've seen, and then we also have and then we also have C. difficile, which are also bacteria, very often causing gas gastrointestinal um, diseases also resistant to many antibiotics. So those are just some examples. 
Okay, then that is it for this whole video. We've covered all the topics, everything that we need to know for immunity, definitely for the OCR specification. The majority of these points also cover um, other exam boards. As I said though at the start, some named examples might be different for maybe AQA and Edexcel, but generally the idea is the same. And yes, if you have any other questions, any comments at all, if you're unsure about anything, please feel free to leave them below. We will definitely answer you. Alternatively, you can even email us. Links for that are also in the description. Essentially, if you're just unsure with anything, if you also want to give any feedback, all of that is below. We absolutely welcome all of this. Thank you very much for your attention. Good luck. See you next time. Goodbye.